Madeline. Oh, I'm Madeline Brosen, and we are both here at uh, the UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies. Um, just letting everyone know, we are um, going to be having the slides available afterwards. We're also recording the webinar, so um, hopefully if you have any other colleagues that weren't able to make it today, um, we will email the link to the uh, webinar, which we'll also have on our project page. So we'll give all that information at the end, um, but hopefully there'll be a lot of different ways that you can access this information outside of this one hour. All right, so let's begin. Um, so how do I advance the slide? Okay. So we're going to um, talk about our approximately two-year research project on performance metrics for walking and biking. Um, and here's our agenda. Um, first, we'll give some background about why these measures exist and why people want to use them. Um, and then we'll talk about the three measures that we looked at. Um, and then we will test them out on real streets and look at a comparison of the scores that these streets got from the three different metrics. Um, and then we'll get into a breakdown of the variables that are in each of the metrics. Um, and after we do that, we'll have a question break. Um, and then we will do a pretty in-depth breakdown of the variables and the formulas in the highway capacity manuals metrics. Um, and at the end of that, we'll have another question break. And then we will show the results of our sensitivity case study, wherein we tried changing the street in the ways that are typical to improve the biking and walking experience. And we saw how these changes changed the scores that these metrics give. Um, and then we'll give some conclusions. Okay, so for some background, um, why we have measures for walking and biking quality. And I think this covers ground that probably a lot of folks on the webinar are familiar with. Um, we had auto level of service as the dominant performance metric for the transportation system um, for many decades. And the way auto level of service was typically used in policy was that it, we had this measure of essentially delay for vehicles, and it gives this grade A, B, C, D, E, or F. Um, and depending on the policy context, if you wanted to do something like build a building, you'd be required to look at how the new traffic that was brought by your building would um, impact LOS. So here's kind of what that would look like. You would study intersections and add the new traffic um, and you know typically there's some threshold D, E, or F um, and then you're required to apply some mitigations or or improvements you could call them improvements um, to to increase the L, to improve the LOS grade at at the intersection and and with auto LOS, the kinds of improvements that we saw were widening, adding lanes, and that kind of thing. Um, and really, this whole this the the dominance of auto LOS and the kinds of the kinds of changes that it brought to the built environment became a big concern for people that cared about anything else aside from LOS. So you know, the street is really hostile to walking and biking. Um, and the improvements that are funded are not necessarily the improvements that, you know, not necessarily the kind of streets that we want to build. So, and it's not just environmental review. We also want to make the point that LOS is used for a variety of, of policy contexts. So, you know, local agencies might just use it to see how their streets are doing. Um, and then there's also the case that I described where you try to understand the effect of future development and that can be something that's involved with nexus fees or something that is a part of the environmental review process. And um, agencies and analysts were also looking at LOS to understand um, proposed scenarios and see how they performed, uh, how different options in an alternative analysis might perform. Um, so out of this came the rise of 
you know, the desire for a more multimodal framework for analysis and evaluation, and, and we started to see some new metrics coming about. So um, with this project, we looked at three of the existing um, measures that have kind of thought about how to do this process for other modes, um, and we're just particularly interested in how they were evaluating the quality for walking and biking. So some of these measures do have, um, like for example, the highway capacity manual has a transit um, level of service as well, but we're focusing here on walking and biking. So the three measures that were looked at predominantly are what are known as the Becky and Pecky tools. These are um, were both created from the San Francisco Department of Public Health. The second was the City of Charlotte. Um, in their urban to street design guidelines, performance measures, they had a similar type of checklist to um, go through a similar process to Becky and Pecky. And then the third measure that we looked at is the pedestrian and bicycle LOS measures in the Highway Capacity Manual in the most recent update in 2010. Um, we, we really, through this process, recognize there are some other similar measures. So, for example, in Fort Collins, Colorado, they have their own multimodal performance measure. This um, tool looks more at kind of area and network characteristics, so looking at the connectivity of the bicycle network or um, the connectivity for pedestrians. So, since it was a different unit, it provided little comparison to our other measures. The second type of similar measure, and one that we're actually seeing um, being used a lot, is called the level of traffic stress. This is only for bicyclists, um, but it kind of similarly kind of provides a, a score. Um, but this was kind of came out around the same time we were starting this project, so uh, we didn't didn't include it. The third is the Danish bicycle level of service. And this is something that um, we've actually had, we'll have the opportunity to explore a little bit going forward this fall, but um, is not in what you're going to see today. <clears throat> and then there may be others that have kind of been created. In California, um, over the past year, we've had a big change in one place that level of service is used. So in California, in the um, CEQA, environmental um, analysis. You cannot use auto level of service to, de to um, figure out transportation impact. So there was a whole process that the California office, um, Governor's Office of Planning and Research went through to figure that out. Um, but that, and what they I think are going towards is kind of a vehicle miles traveled or VMT type measure. Um, but so if you're interested in specifically for environmental analysis, I would take a look at, at their work to see kind of did a lot of thoughtful um, work to see what other measures are available. But for the purpose of which of the rest of you're going to see in the webinar, it's pretty much the measures uh, in black on the left-hand side. So um, what we did is that we are comparing these tools um, to each other. And so to do this, we selected five streets um, in the city of Santa Monica just west of UCLA. And some of these tools that we're using, particularly um, the Highway Capacity Manual, requires a lot of data, um, particularly in terms of um, vehicle volumes and turning movements. So we were restricted to where we really had this data available. And uh, the green dots you're seeing here is kind of the network of traffic counts in Santa Monica. So since they had a very thorough um, traffic monitoring program, we're able to use that as a case study. We looked at five different street segments, as you can see here on the map. Um, so we have a 17th Street, 20th Street, and Cloverfield Boulevard. These are the three parallel streets that you see in green, blue, and purple. Um, we looked at Arizona Avenue, which is kind of um, near the promenade in Santa Monica. And then the third is Main Street, um, so that's the segment in the orange. We have our comparison results from all five of these different routes, and um, those are available in our paper and report. Um, for the purpose of time today, I'm just going to talk through three of the results from uh, 
Arizona, 17th Street, and Cloverfield Boulevard. So Arizona Avenue um, is the street that's kind of, uh, well, I don't know if you'd say downtown Santa Monica, but it's a really big uh, commercial area. Um, what you can see on the right is a picture. Uh, it's two travel lanes. It has a bicycle lane, um, some landscaping, a lot of pedestrian activity. And then what you're seeing in terms of the charts on the left-hand side is the results of our analysis. So to walk you through this a little bit, um, we went out into the field and collected all the information that we would need for all three of the tools here. And then we um, kind of put that in, and this is the results that spit out. So you're seeing the bicycle scores on the top, well, the kind of units of analysis. So we looked at um, three intersections and two links between them. So the, you're having Third Street in Arizona, one intersection, and then you can go towards the right. Um, Herbie will explain this kind of units of analysis um, a little later. Um, just one more thing to orient. Oh, my apologies. My screen just went a little blank. Okay. Um, was that uh, what you're seeing is that the HCM and the Charlotte measure, um, they both use an A through F scale with six categories, and the Becky and Pecky tools use a ideal to not suitable, which is on five. So um, you're saying that they're a little bit different, um, but they're corrected in terms of the graphs. So that's just to orient you to uh, the charts a little bit. So what we're seeing is that um, on Arizona Avenue, um, the, and this is kind of a common thing, is that the, for bicycles specifically, the tools are really kind of in conflict with each other. Um, the Becky tool rated all the intersections along this route as not suitable, and we'll get into why in a little bit. Um, and so those were a little more variable. In terms of the pedestrian scores, it, it ranked them very well. Um, 17th Street is a more residential street. It has a very wide uh, landscaping area with shade and trees. It has no on-street parking two vehicle lanes and a bicycle lane. Uh, the bicycle lane is fairly narrow and is, I think what some would describe, kind of in the gutter, as you can see in the picture here. Um, we saw kind of similar uh, results in terms of the bicycle, and the pedestrian was a little bit all over the board. Um, but overall, you know, it's uh, from kind of a C to an A or reasonable to ideal. Now, uh, lastly, Cloverfield Boulevard, um, this is kind of what we would have expected to have the lowest level of service. Uh, it's the widest street we looked at. It also has access to a freeway. Um, so the uh, pedestrian area is nicely landscaped with sidewalks, but uh, it really has the heaviest, highest traffic volumes. It's about a six-lane road, and that you know, as the environment degraded, we did see some of the measures here, but interestingly, um, the bicycles seem to be a little more kind of in agreement with each other, and the pedestrian was kind of a little all over the board. So, you know, when we kind of take a step back and look at what happened in, in these different scenarios, the question arises is that why? So, why do we see such variation in the scores? And, and the answer is, is fairly simple, but we'll go through in a couple of more charts, is that each tool takes in different inputs and then scores them differently. So um, if you think of the whole universe of things that may matter to you while walking or biking, um, you could different parts of that universe go into these uh, different tools, and then the weight given to each input may be slightly different. So in the Charlotte case, um, they actually only score the intersections, but they take all four approaches into the intersection and then also have some features of the uh, link, so the area between intersections as well. So what you're going to see in these next charts is that on the right-hand side, this is the maximum possible score. It's made up of a variety of different inputs, and then you can see how um, the different streets scored in terms of kind of where they lost 
um, scores here. So if we look back at Arizona, um, the two of the um, approaches did very well. As you're seeing, they got the full points, but two didn't. So then um, in the pedestrian, there's a lot more of kind of factors that go into it. So um, the crossing distance is the main um, co contributor, but then like if it's a one-way street or what the crosswalk is, there's a variety of different things that go into that as well. And um, just for your reference, these charts are not anything that come with the tools, but that are just kind of how we've um, created to kind of visualize where the streets are losing points. On the Becky and Pecky, you're seeing um, the pedestrian on the left and then the bicycle on the right, intersections on the top, and links on the bottom. So in the Pecky tool, there's a, real, there's a lot of things that go in and they kind of have almost equal measure here. Um, the Charlotte tool were not really as certain in terms of how it was developed. Um, the Becky and Pecky tools, there were surveys that were sent to experts, and then based on the responses from the survey respondents, they kind of used that professional judgment at, um, at, to create these different weights and inputs. So um, really, comparatively, like what we were seeing in Charlotte, where you know you could really say, oh, the crossing distance was the most important. In the in the Pecky tool, it's really hard to say um, because it's a, a variety of a lot of factors that are scaled fairly evenly. Um, the link score, you're seeing street design and vehicle traffic um, being major components here, and um, on Cloverfield, so that was our widest street. The the pedestrian scores got the lowest. But a lot of the times, actually, even on our lower volume streets, the scores were fairly low. In terms of the bicycle scores from the, the Becky tool, the, the Becky tool, um, if you may have noticed, we had a very distinct kind of M looking pattern. Um, and that was because the bicycle intersection score is simply three factors, whether there's right turn on red restrictions, whether or not the bike lane is striped through the intersection and the presence or absence of a left-hand bike lane. Um, 14 out of 15 intersections that we looked at had none of these. So um, that's why the scores were always pretty much at the bottom for the Becky tools. The bicycle link is a combination of more factors than the intersection is. So um, similarly to the pedestrian, the vehicle traffic and the street design are kind of the most of it. Um, and you'll see in kind of where streets gained or lost points along the way. Okay, so um, we're going to take the opportunity now to look at any questions people may have from the first portion. So um, if there's questions related to um, the comparison work, uh, we'll get into the HCM here in, in a moment. Um, I'm looking at one question uh, which asked us if we propose any of our metrics to the Governor's Office of Planning and Research for consideration into the SB 743. And um, we, we kind of provided our work, especially a literature review of these measures to, the, um, to OPR, the office that looked at it. And we expressed some concerns, which I think you'll hear um, next, about thinking about using the highway capacity manual um, level of service because it's very onerous. And I think um, Herbie's next presentation will kind of get into that. Um, but yeah, we did provide all of these um, together. So the second question is, how do we normalize the different scales? Um, I think we just kind of took in terms of a percentage um, and where where it kind of went. So if we look back here, um, you're seeing that there are two different. So if if everything was 100 points, for example, um, then you know the blue scale is 
separated into five and six, and then they're just plotted accordingly in terms of where that would go on there. Um, just so you're aware, these are really for visual purposes. And um, in the report itself, you can see a large table of all the individual scores. So the third question we have is that, uh, are we planning to study VMT as a key measure for impact analysis? Um, so this project is, is technically done, um, or will be as the end of this week. Um, and so we're not planning that. I think it would be interesting to look at how that would um, compare to these others, but I think it would take a little more thinking how that would actually happen. Herbie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, well, because we started so long ago, we started before um, the big changes at the state level. So um, the project is really designed to look at me measures that concern the street, whereas VMT is a measure that um, concerns proposed development. Um, so they've become very related in the context of CEQA reform, um, but, but we really just looked at measures that, that measure the street. Um, so the next question was about level of stress. Uh, we did not look at it. Um, I think that it would be interesting also to continue this to see. Um, the level of stress is, um, is pretty straightforward, and I think the methodology that they presented really kind of makes intuitive sense. So, um, you know, I'd be curious if there was like a student that was interested in continuing this work at UCLA to expand that, but um, at this point it's not included. Okay, so some more questions are coming in, um, and there's, there's some interesting ones here, and I think it would be helpful to get through the next section and then answer some more questions. So let's go. So now we'll do the tour of highway capacity manuals, MMLOS uh, method. So, and the reason that we're going to give so much more de detail on the HCM is because the HCM model is quite a bit more complicated and it's it's very difficult to look at the to quickly to quickly understand what impacts the grade um, because the model is uh, unlike Becky Pecky and unlike Charlotte it's not simply adding um, components of the street to reach a total um, things can counteract each other and there are squared terms and um, there are mathematical formulas so uh, we did some work to kind of tease that out so in the HCM, we have the first thing that we have to understand is that the HCM is really specific in how we break the street down into small enough units of analysis such that we can give each of those units a grade and then combine them to understand something bigger. So they have um, intersection, which is what you think it is, and then they have link, which is essentially the space between intersections um, but it can go across unsignalized intersections. And then, so if you had like a busy arterial with signalized intersections that were a mile apart and you had a uniform street design in between those, you could have a link that goes for that whole mile. Um, and then you have a segment, which is um, an intersection and it's downstream link put together and then you put segments together to get a facility score. So if you want to grade anything that is is big, if you want to grade any length of street, you're typically going to have to go through this process to get to a facility score. And then just a reminder that HCM is a grade. Um, there's six grades, A through F. And the way that you get this grade is that you calculate a number and then you can convert it to the grade. And it's helpful to just remind at this point that the lower this number is, the better your grade is, and the higher this number is, the worse your grade is. And then here's just an example of what this looks like. We'll go through each of the ped and bike um, level of service models, but I just want to give like a visual of what this looks like in the end. So this is an example. This is link 
pedestrian level of service. And the way that this looks is the way that most of them look, which is that you have a bunch of variables that are original data that you collect. You put them in a formula that's defined in the highway capacity manual. And these variables are usually organized into factors, which are these Fs. So F sub W is the width factor. F sub V is the volumes factor. F sub S is the speed factor in this case. And then your final level of service is this I um, that you get by adding together the factors. And then we also want to make, this is again an example that is typical of all of them. Um, there's a lot of original data that you need to collect to calculate these methods, to calculate this model. So, um, you know, in this case, you can see the kind of detail that's involved. So, like, proportion of on-street parking occupied, for example, um, or mid-block demand flow rate, so vehicles per hour, for example. So you collect all these variables, and you put them into a formula, and you get a score. Um, and then in the case of HCM, we know exactly where these formulas came from, although it took our team a long time to dig this up. So we're happy to share this table. Um, uh, so for each of bike link, ped link, bike intersection, and ped intersection, there was a study where they would do, they would collect participants um, and they would design a course for these participants to either walk, walk or bike on. And then as they were walking or biking, the um, test administrators would interrupt them and ask them to grade uh, what they just experienced. So, you know, if they're biking and it was the bicycle link study, it would be grade the, grade the segment of road that you just rode on. Um, and then they took these grades and converted them to numbers, and then they did linear regression modeling to, um, with input variables from the literature at the time. So you can just notice like some limitations to this underlying data that um, was used to develop the HCM's method, which is that all the courses were in Florida. Um, it was quite some time ago, so the bicycling environment and walking environment has really changed since then. And the literature and what we know about what influences the experience of walking and biking has really changed since then. So, you know, if you have if you if you have thoughts about what you're about to see in terms of the validity, um, just know that these variables are in because those were the variables that were studied it at the time of the original study and that were that were found to be significant in the regression modeling. Um, and then we also note that with each of these four original studies, we're not aware of there ever being a validity testing. So where these were, these models, as far as we're aware, were never validated on data other than the data used to develop them. Okay, so pedestrian level of service. I'm just going to give a tour and really point you to our report, which breaks down all the variables that all the variables in the process that's involved in coming to a pedestrian level of service. Um, but just a reminder, it's specific to a side of the street. So with um, intersection, we're really talking about crosswalks. And with link, we're really talking about a block face or series of block faces. Um, and then just some of the highlights that I'm about to show you are that in intersection pedestrian level of service, the number of lanes crossed is the most important factor. In link pedestrian level of service, the width of the walking area is the most important factor. And then just to note that seg segment pedestrian level of service incorporates a crossing delay factor. So that looks at how hard it is to cross the street. So here's an example of the kind of thing that you would find in our report. Um, the, so what we did was we generated default cases where we hold all the variables constant, and then vary one variable of interest. So here we're looking at the number of lanes that you're crossing in the crosswalk. Um, and this is one of the biggest factors in intersection pedestrian level of service. You lose about a half a grade for every lane that you add. So just to remember with this scale that the grades are separated by 0.75. So you can see the difference, you know, as you add lanes, is that your, your score is increased, which means you get a worse grade. 
And then here's another example of the type of graph that we produce for our report. So here we look at a variety of cases. So um, just think of all these letters at the bottom of this axis as describing a bunch of different cases that we generated based on realistic values from uh, that you that would be typical on streets in the US. Um, and then we look at the contribution of different of the different factors in determining the final LOS. So you can see that across pretty much all the cases that we could think of that width is the most important thing. Uh, you can also see that delay, which is one of the factors in intersection PLOS, is across all the cases not terribly important. So moving on from the intersection to the link, um, again, the width is very important. So this is a similar graph, lots of cases. Um, in the link, we have some terms that are negative, which means that they help the score, and they offset those terms that are positive. Um, and here we have um, a relatively large negative um, for the width of the walking area, which is to say that the wider the area is that you're walking in, um, the better your grade is going to be. Um, and then the opposite is the case with the volumes. The higher the volumes are, the worse your grade's going to be. Um, and then we, in our report, we, we really exhaustively go through all these variables, but just want to note a couple of them now, which is that uh, we have a larger bonus in this link PLOS for on-street parking occupancy than for adding a sidewalk. Um, and then we tried to note some of the things that these that these grades are not sensitive to, so this one's not sensitive to trees or lighting. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing with bike LOS, just hit on some of the highlights of how this method works. So this one, unlike PED LOS, this is specific to a direction of travel, and it's assuming that you're biking in the roadway. Um, some of the most important factors at the intersection BLOS are what I'm calling bicyclist operating space. That could either be a wide outside lane or bike lane. Um, traffic density is also quite important in the intersection. And then it, at the link, traffic volumes are important. Heavy vehicles are important. And again, bicyclist operating space is important. And then when we get to the segment BLOS, um, we just want to make note that there is an error there. Um, so if you're using this method, it's something that you should be aware of. So here's intersection BLOS. Again, we have this kind of graph where we look at a number of cases and the contribution. Um, and again, we have widths that are that are negative and, and a volume factor that's positive. Um, and the width factor kind of looks at bike lanes. Uh, it gives bike lanes a little more points, more credit than wide outside lanes. Um, and we can see that if you have a wide enough bike lane, it can offset um, Quite, quite a bit of volumes. So link, BL, link BLOS is similar. Um, and something that we want to note here, in addition to the importance of volumes, the importance of the bicyclist operating space, is that the pavement quality is not terribly important, and that the score is not sensitive to different striping configurations. So if you take a wide bike lane and stripe part of it into a into a buffer, um, the the method doesn't know how to analyze that. It's considered equivalent. Similar with cycle tracks, I don't I don't believe that very many of them existed in the U.S. when these models were developed, so um, it can't analyze physically separated uh, bicycle facilities. So here's um, link BLS across a number of cases. This one's a little more of a mixed bag. We see that uh, the green is speeds, the orange is volume, the blue is widths, and that they can all three be very important. Um, you know, you can have high speeds and high volumes, and if you have a wide enough bike lane, you can still get to a pretty decent score. And then our last thing on HCM, um, we just want to note that there seems to have been some kind of error in developing the segment score for the for bicycle level of service. Um, scores above C are not possible because of so you can't get an A or a B because of this. There's a large constant, 
And this matters because if you wanted to grade a facility that extends for some miles, you might find yourself just like, why can't I give it above a C and this is why. Okay, so questions. So we're going to go to the question and we're just going to pull out a couple that are the kind of HCN specific here. Um, so one is about the number of participants and uh, we completely agree that this is a big concern. Well, um, we should probably read the question. Yeah. So this question is the number of participants in the original source appears to be rather low. I expected samples using hundreds of participants. So yeah, um, we would expect so as well. Um, but I think there was a little bit of um, smoke and mirrors in, in a sense of that like there was, you know, 60 participants that graded you know, 60 different intersections or something like that. So through multiplication, the end seemed really high. But then when you broke it down in terms of what went in, kind of unpacked that end, it, it seemed to be more of a concern. Um, the second question or comment is the lack of validation of the results beyond the original survey data appears to be a serious and significant lack of foundation for the MMLOS. Is there any effort to validate the original results? Um, I do not to our knowledge, there is not. Um, if you um, are interested in this, there's the TRB uh, Quality Level of Service Committee, and they're the, the people that um, are doing that. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to get in touch with them and, and see if they are putting in like a research need statement to that question. So the next question is, do we consider a bicycle level of comfort? Um, no, I'm not familiar with that. And there are, I mean, especially with bicyclists, there's been a big, a lot of these different measures. Um, and I recently actually just saw kind of a big table that had all of this. Um, and maybe we can kind of post that, just let you know. So we just kind of cherry picked a couple of them. And then there's a question, do we know how widely the HCM MMLOS is being applied? Um, it's being applied, um, I think especially by state DOTs um, who are used to looking at the level of service on all of their state highways. I've seen a couple state DOTs that have looked at the BLOS on all of their um, state highways. At the same time, we've seen limited application by local agencies. It's relatively a difficult method to apply, so I, I'd say the answer is yes and no. Um, the next question, I think, the, a couple other ones we're going to come back to, um, we might touch on these in our conclusion. So, yeah, and we'll have more time for questions at the end. So this is our last section. <clears throat> so, you know, the first part we did this project was looking at a couple of different um, measures, figuring out how really they were developed, comparing them to each other. I think the comparison really just, we got a little more confused than than we were, would have liked to. So we, just, we uh, had planned to do kind of some scenario testing. Um, it's not necessarily a true sensitivity analysis. Because we didn't really just hold one thing, con you know, one, everything else and change one thing in, in these cases. What we did is trying to think about how would really these measures be used. And since a lot of the time, um, they, you know, level of service measures can understand um, how different um, alternatives may kind of serve users. That's what we wanted to think through here. So we chose 17th Street, which kind of fell in the middle of our measures and seemed, there seemed to be room for improvement on that street. So here's five different scenarios that we looked at. Um, the first one is kind of what's your typical road diet. So a five to three um, with a bicycle lane and a uh, then a painted buffer. In scenario two is the same as scenario one, but we're going to add physically uh, physically separated um, some kind of pylons there. Uh, the third one is kind of an alternate road diet, and that uh, we're there's kind of we're having a, two travel lanes on one and one on the other. We have, again, the six-foot bike lane, and then we've also added on-street parking in this because there wasn't uh, parking otherwise. Scenario four uh, we is 
similar to scenario three, where we've actually flipped the location and used the parking lane as a physical separation for the bike lane. And scenario five is uh, kind of similar to scenario one, but we've included a, a raised center median. So this would allow for um, like protected mid-block crossings. In addition to these um, improvements along the cross section, there was a host of um, changes we proposed at the intersections. So right turn on red restrictions, adding leading pedestrian intervals, perpendicular curb ramps, bicycle boxes, changing the signal phasing to protected left turns. Um, in a couple of places where there are bus stops, adding kind of a bus bulb. Um, and then at the case, I'm um, in the southern end of our um, segment here, there was a median, but it stopped before the crosswalk. So we've added kind of a nose or something to actually protect the pedestrians there. So here's just the cheat sheet to kind of go back and remember that. So um, looking, we're going to go through this just by measure. So in terms of Becky and Peggy, what you're seeing in the purple was what it was before, um, this M shape that we saw all over. And uh, we saw really about across the board improvements, um, but really none of the intersections raised above basic. And pretty much all the scenarios are similar to each other. So it didn't really matter if it was a, um, if there was any barriers um, that was the same as the paint. And in scenario four, which was our parking protected lane, it was not able to even input that. In terms of the PECI, um, the intersection scores didn't change. They remain the same. They're pretty much at the maximum. We saw some um, increases, um, but very little variation um, in terms of like whether how much space they had pedestrians had to cross. But you could really think like, for example, um, in scenario three or I mean, like in scenario four, you know, the effective uh, street, you know, you're only having to cross really three travel lanes here um, versus like five before, but we really didn't see much change. Oops, hopefully that'll go away. Um, so, um, there it goes. In Charlotte, uh, another interesting result is that we actually saw um, all the scores raised the exact same. And this is due much to the fact that Charlotte takes all four approaches into consideration and the improvements we were proposing just along uh, 20th Street, as you can see here. Sorry for the typo on the earlier slide. Um, and so that really didn't do much. Um, the, the pedestrian got almost perfect, um, but the bike still degraded as it went towards Olympic. Um, much of the difference that we saw here was that Charlotte doesn't really distinguish between a turn lane and a general lane. So even if you were um, taking away a general traffic lane and converting it to a turn lane um, to like give you space for, for bike lanes or something, it wouldn't this measure would not give you any points for the reduction in through lanes. Um, the HCM had the kind of most inconsistent or the scenarios are most different from each other. Um, if you can see here, uh, it was actually the score was off the charts um, in scenarios one or two because it interpreted that buffer space as an extremely wide bike lane. Um, so, and there's no limit on that in the math. Um, scenario three, where we added on-street parking, that actually brought it down the most. And a lot of that is because we had to use an assumed value, and it's very sensitive to the amount of on-street parking. So, if you have to use an assumed value that it's sensitive to, that's going to probably skew your results. Similarly here, um, the HCM could not interpret the uh, scenario four, which was the parking protected bike lane. Um, interestingly, in the PED results, the, none of the intersections moved whatsoever. Um, and the, the on-street parking was actually the greatest benefit to pedestrians. So here we're seeing the same treatment is bringing down the bike score and increasing the PED score. So that's the green line here. Um, I think 
one of the most interesting things out of this chart is that even with the kind of wide variety of improvements that we suggested, that we saw pretty much, we saw no improvement um, at the intersections whatsoever. So uh, quickly talk about some limitations. They couldn't really distinguish between a painted and a physical buffer. None of them were able to score physical separations. None of the, while we didn't um, propose a painted, like a green lane in any of our scenarios, it's, we knew it wasn't an input. And you know, part of what this process really elucidated to us was that the tools are rather inflexible, um, but the Becky and Pecky and Charlotte, which are a spreadsheet, could be more easily changed um, compared to the HCM, which has its own software to run. So in order to really operationalize anything like being able to score a cycle track, um, there would have to be a lot more work done on the back end. All right, so this is our last slide, um, and these are just some of our conclusions. Um, so we, we found that there's no silver bullet among these measures, um, even with improvement scenarios that, you know, we think really improve the environment for biking and walking, we don't necessarily see a consensus from these measures that they get better grades. Um, and then the other thing that our next conclusion is really that each of these measures is mired in the time it was created. So with any kind of innovative treatment, we're not able to measure that if it didn't exist when the metric was developed. Um, and that's, you know, kind of an inherent limitation to even the best metric. And then our third point is, and it seemed like some of the questions were kind of getting at this, like, are these measures useful? Um, and to some extent, it depends, obviously, on the context. There may be, like, some utility to inventorying the kinds of things that Charlotte or Becky Pecky would have you inventory. Um, but because the biking and pedestrian experience is this multi-dimensional experience that has a lot of aspects, it has an aspect of delay, it has an aspect of comfort, it has an aspect, um, it has, you know, various dimensions even within comfort, um, and different users might disagree on which of those parts are most important, like some one user might be very into being shaded, and another user might be very into being separated from vehicles. Um, because there are those kinds of conflicts to such a greater extent than there are with the experience of driving, um, that cities might be better served by just thinking about which aspects of the biking and pedestrian experience are important to them and which aspects they want to measure, rather than trying to get one grade that incorporates all the aspects. Um, and then the last point is really just along those same lines, you know, because you have s so many inputs, the final grade that you get, it, it's sort of hard to look at the grade and know what's driving it um, in any case, um, and it's especially hard with HCM. So um, we're going to go to the questions um, with our last five minutes here. Um, oh, lastly, before we get into that, um, is we really tried hard to have um, the reports done for uh, today, but we missed the mark a little bit. So, um, but we will have everything up, including this presentation, the link to recording on our project page, and we'll definitely um, let people know. We'll send an email to all the attendees um, when those are ready, which will be this week. So let's get back to some of the questions. Um, uh, one of them was, did we do all the HCM by hand or do you use the software? Yeah, we use the um, Kittleson software, um, the Complete Streets LOS, so it, it's within that. Um, the charts and graphs that Herbie showed were just kind of taking a couple of those formulae out. Um, let's see, what other questions? So, yeah. I guess the answer to whether we did the analysis by hand or did we use a software package is yes. We <laughs> did it by hand and we used a software package. Um, 
the, the another question is, seems like the concerns um, that we talked about with HCM in terms of survey respondents, application, validation, apply to all the approaches. And I, I would tend to agree with that. Um, that's um, why it's interesting if, if, like, in Charlotte, since they kind of tied this to their urban street design guidelines, they could at least say that, you know, that these speak directly to that. So it's that's why it's kind of helpful to think through what's important in your city and if you can connect it with other existing policy, comprehensive plan, specific plan, um, it's easier to kind of point to the importance of the individual inputs. Yeah, and I would say that while the HCM is the only one that is based on empirical data, I mean, to its credit, uh, I mean, I think that empirical data is so limited that the validity is still quite questionable. And then I think the difference with HCM is that it's in a national standard. So there's a higher, you know, there's a higher bar for it to meet in terms of validity than some of these other metrics where they've kind of taken a list from experts and put it together and, and tried to use it to develop a grade. Um, the next question is, what tools would we recommend at the local level? Um, and is level of traffic stress better than all of those? Um, I think through our analysis, we didn't even really come up with a, you know, a value judgment in terms of, you know, bad to better. Um, I think that it is one of the things that we heard during the SB 743 process is that level of service is a way that we communicate to the public, so that is a consideration. And level of traffic stress, I think, is the easiest to explain to the public. Um, so if you're using it for kind of a planning purposes, it may do that. Um, this will, it's only for um, bicyclists at this moment, though. I'm not aware of them trying to do it for pedestrians. Um, so if you're looking at bicycle measures, I think it, it holds a lot of promise. Um, Oh, sure. So uh, it looks like Eileen Lowe has had her hand raised. So we're going to go ahead and unmute Eileen. Eileen, you're unmuted um, if you'd like to say something. Hi, thanks. You answered my question. That I asked about the bicycle level of comfort. Oh, okay. Where, oh, okay. Where is that measure from? Uh, Maryland DOT and potentially other states have tried it. Maybe Texas, I'm not certain. Okay. Great. We'll make a note of that. Yeah, we, we are would like to uh, consider how we might um, measure um, bicycle uh, experiences on the state highway system. Hmm. Yeah, and so this is, that actually kind of brings an interesting point that this is mostly for urban street analysis is the application we're thinking of. All right, thanks, Eileen. Um, let see, maybe we can do one last question. Um, let's see. Mm. Uh, just an easy one to get out of the way. There isn't anything on the report um, on the project page, but there will be this week, and we'll let you know. We'll send everyone a quick email once we get our reports up. Um, there is one paper. Uh, that was published in the transportation research record that you can get now, but that information will be in the report as well. Um, I think an interesting question that is if state, if, you know, departments of transportation, I'm not sure if this is kind of at the, um, you know, local or state level are moving into using the HCM as a measure. How are we going to push forward innovation, innovative bike facilities? Um, and that's a good question. I think it's a, we really want to make sure that everyone's involved if your state is interested in, in doing those facilities, um, that you're kind of making those concerns like vocal, um, and that it's aware that it's a deficiency in this measure. Um, I think it's a good question that I don't entirely know the answer to. Yeah, I think like one of our goals in this project is to make it easier for agency staff to to know how the method works so that if you can use our work as a reference then 
agencies can make their own decisions about whether this whether these grades are useful or not um, and, and how they might be or how they might not be. But I think up until now, it's been kind of a black box. And like you put something in the black box and it spits out C. Um, and I think people haven't really known, you know, what the meaning of that is. So to some extent, like the analysis is being done, but I haven't seen it being terribly consequential in, in terms of decision making yet because it's not well enough understood. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's just to also make sure that we're kind of, uh, as yeah, we can see the rise in these th of new treatments, that the tools are kind of keeping up with that. Um, and if not, just make sure that, you know, it's really aware of that. Um, so I think uh, we've answered most of the questions. Um, you give us a lot of food for thought. Um, in respect of everyone's time, we're going to end now, but um, please, please feel free to shoot either Herbie or me an email, and thank you so much for attending, and we'll let you know when you can get the reports, and we'll also put up this presentation as well. Yeah, thanks for attending. It was really exciting to have so many people, and this was our first webinar, so please let us know any feedback you have, even on like technical, technical issues or anything like that. Um, it's been great sharing our research with you all. Yeah. Thanks so much.